Kari Lazar White, who is the founder and executive director for Brotherhood Sister Soul, uh, right here in Harlem, New York. Uh, Brotherhood Sister Soul is a phenomenal organization that works with young people um, around sort of creative youth development principles and, and cultural aspects of developing young minds, bodies, and spirits. Um, Kari was also an awardee at the 2016 conference um, in Chicago this year and gave a bang up speech as well as an amazing workshop. And we were hoping to share some of that wisdom with a much broader audience. And that is why we invited him here today to talk to you all about sort of social justice, um, leadership and institution building. So without further ado, Kari, I'd like to turn things over to you. This session is going to be recorded. And I wanna also encourage you all to use the chat um, to take the conversation um, to, to typing. So Kari, thank you for joining us today and, and you're ours for the next hour. Sounds good, thank you, James. Uh, hello to everybody on the chat. Uh, normally when I talk with folks, everybody, we go around and everybody says who they are and where they work and what they do. But if we do that, that'll fill the whole hour and I don't think James will be happy with me. So hopefully today we can, uh, we can uh, move from that normal model and still I'd like it to be a conversation. So I wanna talk about this issue of social justice and how you build a strong institution and organization but i really hope that we can have a conversation and and more kind of give and take um there's a short video that we'll show as well um but as opposed to you know just hearing me talk for an hour it would seem better to, to have a more in-depth conversation so hopefully that works with everybody um you know i think when we think about building a social justice organization in general um building a strong organization that's focused on issues of social justice is a serious endeavor. It's a major undertaking. Um, but you know, I would submit that over the last year um, with the political climate that we live in and the times that we live in and the election um, of Trump to the presidency, it makes our work that much more critical. Um, it also makes our work in many ways even more complicated. Uh, we were doing social justice work before the recent election. We'll be doing social justice work, unfortunately, for a very, very long time. It'll take a long time to really ensure that this country lives up to its founding creeds, that we create equity in this country and equality and opportunity. Um, and so the struggles we're involved in around issues of gender and race, around the environment, anti-poverty, engaging through the arts to create spaces for opportunity. You know, this is longstanding work. It's been going on since the founding of the country and it will continue to go on, but it has gotten different in this recent election and has gotten in certain ways I think more complicated. Um, when I think about building a social justice organization there are three spaces that I really think about and I'll talk about briefly. Mission and program, uh, staffing, and then board related issues as well. We are a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. We're a social justice institution but I also always underline the fact that it's a 501c3 corporation. Um, and I don't mean all the negative connotations of a corporation that are out there and often warranted, but instead, what does it mean to build an institution and a strong organization? Um, and so I think one of the most critical things is to really be mission focused. And so Brotherhood Sister Soul, we've had a mission that's evolved over the last two years, but it's remained, I think, remarkably consistent with what our founding mission has been. And so the theory of change here at Brosis is to provide support, guidance, education, and love to young people then to teach them to form discipline and order in their life, and then to provide opportunities and access so they can develop agency. That's the process we move young people through to become folks who can break cycles of poverty, can follow their dreams, and can become social justice makers in their own right. So support, guidance, education, and love, then to teach discipline and order, and then to provide opportunities and access so they can develop agency in their own right. When we talk about social justice in this country, it's really important for us all, I think, to remember the role of young people in social justice, whether the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the gay and lesbian movement for equality, the anti-war movement that brought down a president in Lyndon Johnson. Um, that was driven by young people. Uh, I was talking to actually a perfect intersection of social justice and art. We have our big gala next week, and one of our honorees is Carrie Mae Weems kind of the personification of the intersection of those two issues. And she was at our building earlier and we were talking about the role of young people um, in the civil rights movement. And during the time of the Freedom Rides, 
Um, you know, it was only about 600 people who really went on these freedom rides, white and black, of different ethnic backgrounds, religious back backgrounds, into the South to stand up for freedom and equality. Um, and at one point, Bobby Kennedy was very concerned about the optics of the freedom rides. He was very concerned about young people, black and white college students, being assaulted, of course, as they moved through the South. He was concerned for their safety, but he was also concerned about the optics for the nation. And he had his chief deputy call Diane Nash, um, who was one of the youth leaders of SNCC. She was 20 years old, and try to convince them not to go on the scheduled Freedom Ride. Um, and when they reached Diane Nash by phone, obviously pre-today's era, they probably had to track her down through a landline. There was no cell phone reaching. Um, he asked her not to get on the, that bus. And Diane Nash, all 20 years old, responded to the Attorney General's assistant saying that she had already written her last will and testament. She had already decided she was prepared to die for this cause. And so as a social justice organization, I think it's always important to keep front and center the role of young people in the movement, their energy, their commitment, um, and quite honestly, their bravery as well. And so our mission guides everything we do. It guides how we do our staff development. It guides how we design our building. It's written into our board of directors bylaws that every decision of the organization must be made in keeping with our mission statement and furthering our goal. It can't be about individual board members, personal desires or political influences. It has to be about what is the organization founded on. And we were founded on four themes, positivity, knowledge, community, and future. And so we have our internal governing documents, as I say to our staff during professional development, you know, there are constitution or there are bill of rights. We have our theory of change. We have our mission. We have our four framing themes, positivity, knowledge, community, and future. We have our framework for analysis, which is a detailed educational statement on what we teach and how we teach it. And then finally, we have our 10 curriculum focus issues. What do we think that young people in general need to know about to become politically astute today, to understand the conditions they're born into? Very specifically for our population, what do we think black and Latino youth living in an economically deprived condition need to know about? And those issues range from understanding their history and Pan-African and Latino history, understanding issues of sexism and misogyny and bias reduction, understanding sustainability in the environment, drug education and violence prevention, an array of things that young people need to learn about to become strong adults. Those documents guide everything that we do. And we constantly return to that during our staff development and our staff training to ensure that we're making decisions um, that are in keeping with the mission of the organization. If it's not mission driven and you're working for social justice, then you're going to quickly get moved into spaces where you don't want to work. You're going to seek funding that you, does not align with your mission. You're going to potentially take political decisions that mute what you do or what you're most focused on. There has to be some overarching philosophy to social justice work that combines and provides the fiber. For us, that fiber consists of the mission, the curriculum, et cetera. The second space that we think is absolutely critical is about staff. Our staff are obviously the frontline people who are doing the political education with our young people, who are doing the leadership development. They're an unbelievably committed group of folks. But I think diving into who they are and how we bring them on is the second part. So first you have the mission and the educational philosophy. Well now, who's doing your teaching? Uh, we have about 30 full-time staff. Half of the staff are alumni of the organization. So right off the bat, they're deeply vested in this community. They're vested and connected to the mission. They went through the, the program themselves. We have an average tenure of seven years, which is also very rare in the nonprofit sector. To have folks who have been involved that long, it provides institutional memory, but it's also about expertise, right? We all get stronger in our craft, in our work, the longer we work in a space, hopefully. If we don't burn out, hopefully what happens is we become more skilled and more adept. And so having the long-term involvement allows us to do the professional development and the training of our staff but it's also critical for the young people that they see consistency and continuity. All too often, our young people are used to, you know, adults coming in and out of their life. Um, it's about young people who don't have that consistency from elders. And so we know that they need to be here long term. So how do we do that? 
when we have a job announcement that goes out and we have the, you know, 100 applicants who apply online, there's the initial sifting through of a resume that in other places maybe would create the avenue for employment, but that's just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, we do from that a phone interview to fully vet the resume to see if it's going to work our in-person time. We then have an in-person interview, which would be your kind of normal 45-minute face-to-face with key decision makers. Um, and that's to get further vibe that if this is the right person and to kind of do the general due diligence. After that, they have to do something that we call the ideological scenario interview. For that, we bring in the people they're going to work with. If they're going to be a sister soul chapter leader and work with young women, then who are their peer women staff going to be? And they should be in the room. And then we throw scenarios at the potential staff person. Um, there are not necessarily right answers, but there are a lot of wrong answers. You know, what would you do if a young person came to you and said, they were pregnant, how would you respond to that? Well, I would tell them that they have to have an abortion. That's the wrong answer. I would tell them abortion is murder. That's the wrong answer, right? It's how do you help young people through a difficult process, providing your expertise, connecting them to the medical health professionals that we have, bringing in the family. Are you using a youth-focused, youth-centered, engaged approach to youth development? And we wanna make sure that that's what you're gonna do because nobody has all the right answers. How do you respond when a young person says, my school is crumbling, why should I keep going to school? Or how do you respond if a young person says, you know, I'm gonna drop out of school and go get a job? These are difficult decisions that young people are making in their life. And if you're taking on the role of being a mentor, teacher, advisor, coach, father figure, mother figure, whatever it is, you know, we have to make sure that the instincts are right. After that, they then run a workshop for the population they're applying to work with in front of our senior staff. And at the end, we ask young people, what did they think about that person? And the staff weigh in. And you get constituent support because now their peers, the senior staff, and the young people have all experienced that person as a youth worker. And we have people who move through those first four stages and are kind of so-so with the adults. And then they're wonderful, charismatic educators with our young people. And they're able to hold the room, and some of them have been hired. We have other people who are great with the adults, and then... They finish with our young people and they leave the room and our young people start laughing and say, well, eat that person alive. You know, there's no way they'll be able to hold the room and inspire us and keep us during those after school hours. And so after those four tiers, we then ask each staff person to sign an agreement, which is not enforceable in any kind of court of law, but does ensure kind of commonality of understanding that they commit to a minimum of three years to work for the organization. Um, and so that process, we think, vets and gets high quality people and then ensures folks who are going to make a long-term commitment. We then do all the things that we think are the intersection of how you treat staff in issues of social justice. We work to raise the money to provide, you know, full health care benefits for our staff. We give a very good vacation package because they work very hard while they're here and we want to ensure that they have the time for their families and the, the mental health support that they need to, to have breaks as needed. Um, we do a huge amount of professional development and training and ensure that our staff are, have senior staff twice a week to bounce ideas off of, to talk about what's happening in the room with young people so that they can develop and hone their skills. We have outside folks who come in and run workshops for our staff so that they can develop really core skills, classroom management, accessing emergency housing for our social worker staff, for our young people. But sometimes it's to understand the times. And so to return to the election of Trump, we've done an eight to 10 part series with our staff of understanding the roots of American fascism, right? And what the McCarthy era period was like. What does it mean to attempt to silence the press? What are checks and balances with the judiciary? Um, what does it mean to protest in a time when there's an attempt to silence protest? You know, a lot of things that we felt our young people needed, our staff needed to young, uh, know about in order to train our young people. You have to train the frontline staff to do that work with young people. So you have the institution building of mission driven with our young people. You have the institution building of ensuring your staff are in line. And then for any nonprofit, your board is absolutely essential. Uh, we have an extremely engaged 24 person board. That board, um, all members have to be able to leverage substantial resources for the institution. That doesn't necessarily mean financial, that can mean that they can secure somebody like a Carrie Mae Weems as an honoree. It may mean they can bring in an in-kind donation of legal support for our young people who are immigrants or undocumented so that they can be protected. Maybe it means they have deep 
expertise in issues of uh, sustainability and the environment, and they can help train our young people on those issues. We also need board members who can write substantial checks or bring in resources. There's, there's no way around that uh, to support a social justice organization, especially one like ours, which oftentimes takes political positions that uh, you know put us um, in a position where sometimes policymakers are not happy with us, where we're aggressively pushing for social justice and reforms that our young people need and are not doing it always in, in the most political way. And so to have a board who's very engaged, we have very active committees to constantly revisit with the executive committee and with the co-chairs, what are the proper committees in place to make sure that the board functions efficiently. Our board received an award from the volunteer consulting group for excellence in management, but also just like with the staff, there's a very intensive process for bringing on board members of interviewing and meeting with fellow board members of going through a process of signing an agreement that's five pages long about what they'll provide to the organization and being accessible and making all decisions in furtherance of the organization's mission. Um, we try to be really intentional about what we do here. We make plenty of mistakes, but the mistake is not, not being intentional. We are always trying to think through how do we strengthen the organization? How do we strengthen our programs? How do we strengthen our staff? How do we strengthen our board? One of the areas that, that folks wanted me to talk today a little bit about is about our work in policy and how the social justice work connects to policy. And at Brother and Sister So, we really work in all aspects that affect policy and social justice. So we're doing the political education of young people. At our best, we're trying to aspire to the work that SNCC did, let's say, to help teenagers to become very politically aware of the conditions that they face. You know, our young people are, are born into abject financial poverty. And I always say financial poverty and not just poverty, or I tried to, because when you look up the word poverty in the dictionary, it says deficient. It says lacking in value. It says having no worth. And clearly, we don't feel our young people are deficient or lacking in value or have no worth. Um, what we know is that they're born into desperate economic conditions, but they have great attributes and great culture and great families that they come from and a great history. And so we want them to understand that they were born into the zip code they were born into or the housing project here in New York or the economic deprivation of the poor school through no fault of their own. We can talk about a lot of the adults who've contributed to those situations, but clearly the 10 year old is not responsible for his or her community or his or her district. And so we have to do a lot of political education so that our young people can understand their conditions. And then we want them to become social change makers, to speak out against issues of sexism and misogyny and homophobia and racism, and try to work towards positive social change. We know that that's critical. We try to create platforms for social justice. And so our young people who write poetry, at the height of it, we've published their work in an introduction from Sekou Sundiata, a closing from Nikki Giovanni. They're, these poets have performed in 35 countries around the world speaking out for peace and justice through the spoken word. We received a grant to create short documentaries, and so we funded alumni to make five, six, seven minute films that talk about issues of misogyny and patriarchy, talk about issues of violence in the criminal justice system, talk about police reform, so that their voices are out there. In New York City, there was a huge effort to reform stop and frisk. Um, our young people spoke out on the issue, when the New York Times published the only first person analysis of the issue, it was Nicholas Pert, an alumni who wrote, why is the NYPD after me? If you Google it, it's millions of hits. The current mayor, de Blasio, said his entire perspective was changed on the issue because of Nicholas. But we also contributed to litigation. We were named witnesses in the class action lawsuit. We helped to organize protests, both allowed and not allowed, and took over streets in the city to protest the injustice of stop and frisk. 10 million stops under the Bloomberg administration, 90% of whom were black and Latino. 96% of those stops resulted in absolutely no charges or arrest. So it was a fishing expedition that the courts found to be unconstitutional. And so we worked through the courts and we worked outside. We created art and documentaries and poetry. Uh, we also engaged with the Manhattan District Attorney and with the mayor's office, trying to argue from within that these things must be changed. And so when Bill de Blasio announced a change in the policy on the stage with a police commissioner at the time, Bratton, the head lawyer of the city of New York Corporation Council, Zach Carter, Bill de Blasio, 
and Nicholas Perk, who spoke that day about what his experiences were like. I mean, that's about the intersection of social justice and organizing resulting in a policy win. And Lord knows that doesn't happen all the time. I've had to talk to some of our young organizers and say, you can't expect this kind of success in every organizing effort that you're a part of. There's a lot of work still to be done. And so now we're involved in some of the efforts to shut down Rikers Island here in New York City or to raise the age as New York is one of only two states that continues to prosecute juveniles as adults and put juveniles in adult penitentiaries. Um, and so how do you mix social justice and art and activism and policy? That's the kind of work we focused on here. Um, and so one of those short documentaries we created is called My Liberation is Your Liberation. And it's about how we train youth activists in this organization to see their connection to both the history of organizing, but also the intersectionality between so much of the work that we're working on today. That if you're struggling for equality and full rights for women in this country, you should be struggling for equality and full rights for immigrants and struggling for equality and full rights for black folk. That there's an intersectionality there as an example. Um, and so this short was created by an alumni, produced by the Brotherhood Sister Soul, and features the voices of our young people and our staff. And if we can play it now, I think it'll give you some context to this, this issue of social justice and institution building. And then when we come back, I'll, I'll say a few more things and then hopefully we'll have an open conversation. So without further ado, my liberation is your liberation. I'm not hearing any audio. I hope others are. The Liberation Program was founded in 1999 with the idea that young people not just needed a space to learn about their history and learn about young people as leaders, but a space to exercise what they were learning, a space for them to be guided by other folks as they were developing skills as activists and organizers, and then using those tools to actually go on ahead and tackle issues that matter to them. With the Liberation Program, it's really making sure that they're developing their identities as activists and organizers and using that as an opportunity to do positive work in the neighborhoods or communities that they identify with. Some of the work that Liberation Program members have done in the community have ranged from advocating for the rehabilitation of an abandoned school building in our neighborhood to getting information out to tenants about what their rights were to looking at issues within their schools around over suspension, police surveillance, and creating a student bill of rights. What inspired me to be active in my community was realizing the injustice that exists. Um, and though I didn't quite call it injustice at 16, um, I definitely knew there was a discrepancy in what certain people were receiving and what others were. And it was something that made me uncomfortable. Even if I could talk about it at home, I couldn't really talk about it in school. And I felt as though there should be a place to discuss it, to learn more about why it exists, um, the roots of it, and also to be in to dissect it so as to change it. Preparing young people to do this work, especially in a community like Harlem, is wonderful because Harlem has this history of youth activism and people being engaged, but also so many things that are impacting young people in New York City today and in Harlem specifically. There's a need for young people to step up and say, not in my name, this is how we're gonna move forward and this is how I'm gonna be in contribution to making a social change.
So people are free. I still hear my brother crying. I can't breathe. Now I'm in the struggle singing. I can't leave. I love history, but I love the history that it almost seemed like we weren't supposed to be learning in school. Like you'd hear about Malcolm X, you'd hear about Martin Luther King, but we never heard about Hubert Harrison. We never really heard about Marcus Garvey. You never heard about the rent strikes or anything like that. And when you look at it, you know, saying 1964, the killing of James Powell, who was 15 years old, you know, really sparking those riots in Harlem. And then that spreading through the rest of the country, it actually meant that, okay, well, it wasn't just, you know, the adults. It wasn't just the elders and that um, young people had a role in that. In the U.S., youth-led movements are not new. When we look at organizations like the Young Lords Party, the Black Panther Party, folks were young and they were taking the lead. So the Freedom Schools, registering people to vote in the Deep South, that was led by a diverse group of young people from throughout the country to make sure that all citizens had the right to vote. The role of young people in the women's rights movement and the rights for LGBTQ communities involved in the Chicano movement, also thinking about the role of young people on an international level. We look at the Soweto uprising in the 1970s in South Africa, young people who came together to say enough is enough and we're not going to take this apartheid regime that's treating us as less than, we're going to step up for the betterment of our country and for our people. And so to see young people at the plate now in 2015, it's expected and it's absolutely what's still wanted and needed in the country. At the core of what we do in the Liberation Program is linking the young people, their history now, with the context of what's happened or what has happened in our neighborhood throughout the times. I think it's up to young people to develop their rebellion and use it in a way to transform society. They need to know the history and they need to know a variety of tactics that have been used so that they can create new ones. We understand that the young people that they're working with, they're strong, you know what I'm saying, and they're powerful. And it's going to be that power that's going to bring the change that a lot of us have wanted for so long. So, um, can everybody hear me? Is that, uh, are we back on to audio? James, can you hear me? Yep, got you loud and clear, Kari. So, you know, that film, that video was made by Frank Antonio Lopez. He started with us when he was 15 years old. Um, he came in self-described as a great battle MC from Washington Heights who could take anyone out, but his lyrics were not, um, very socially conscious. He came into the institution, he learned about politics and his history and who he was, and all of a sudden it evolved and he became a poet with social conscience and social commentary. Um, we supported him as he went off to NYU and to Tisch to become a filmmaker. He joined a group called the Peace Poets, and the Peace Poets have a, a video on our site as well that I believe was sent out in advance. If not, it can be sent out post um, and it tells the story of them, five alumni of the organization who have used their social justice training and their art form to go to 30 countries, places that I'm proud of them are going and places that sometimes I'm terrified they go from Sudan to Afghanistan. And they're doing peace work in these places, inspired by what they've learned and the violence that they faced, um, in this case, as Black and Latino men, one of them has a piece about the first time he held a gun being the age of six. What that produced in him was a visceral desire to never be around that kind of violence and instead to use his art form um, to inspire others to live a life of peace and nonviolence. Um, and so you hope that the result of your social justice organization and your training allows for spaces for the training of the next generation. And that all too often we have people sitting in seats for all too long as opposed to ensuring that there are avenues and pathways for the next generation of youth leaders. And so I return to our theory of change, that we're providing support, guidance, love, and education to children, teaching them to have discipline and order in their life, 
and then providing opportunities and access so they can develop their own agency. And I think that agency and social justice are intertwined, that people feel empowered to speak up, that people claim their right to a just and more equitable society, that they claim their right as social justice makers to work towards that world, to make America not what it is, certainly, but what it can be, the vision for the country, that they're invested in that. Um, and so that's what we hope for our young people every day. In terms of our institution, one of the links that went around is about the next step for the organization. We're gonna be building a state-of-the-art after-school space um, that's a 20,000 square foot building, 100% committed to education use, social justice and policy work, um, arts education, and training the field. We've existed in our building that's 4,000 square feet that was built 120 years ago. We've been here for 17 years. It's falling apart at the seams. And all of us in the sector know the importance of the after-school hours, how key the summer and after-school hours are for engaging young people. That even if a young person is in a decent school, if they're not having the opportunities afforded to most middle class and certainly wealthy kids of constantly being stimulated uh, intellectually, there's a two month academic drop each year, even if they're safe, but if they're playing video games or just in the house or sitting on the stoop, there's a two month drop every year. That culminates in two years over their secondary years. So that's a massive drop and that's the space we step into and so many after school arts providers work in that space. We want to build one of the models for the field. What does that after school time look like? What does that space look like? And so this would be 100% committed to young people. Historically, we don't get much government support, but this will be a project supported by the city of New York. Uh, we got the largest capital allocation from our city council. We're very fortunate to have a deeply progressive city council here in New York City. And so we were able to, because of our broad social mission vision, we were able to get support from the Women's Caucus from the Black Latino Asian Caucus, from the Progressive Caucus. Each of the caucuses were connected to us because our work is broad. We have a broad umbrella in terms of the work that we do. We may work most directly with Black and Latino youth, but we see our justice issues, our freedom and liberation issues intertwined with others. And so we're gonna be building this building, which will be a model for the field, um, and represents to me the final stage of building a social justice organization. What it ensures is long-term presence of Brotherhood Sister Soul. It is bricks and mortar that says to the community and says to the field, this work is vitally important. And it's not just important to build buildings for your next corporate institution or your next thing that makes money, but it's important to build an institution and a brick and mortar representation of education for children, of arts and activism, and of social justice. And so that's the next stage of social justice institution building for Brotherhood Sister Soul, and it represents where we're kind of going in the future. So with that, I wanna stop as we're 35 minutes in, see what some of the questions are, um, and have a conversation with those of you who are, who are joining me today. When asking questions, I just wanna encourage you all to feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask away. Uh, we did have one question that came in from Leo Kari. Um, Leo, do you want to go ahead and ask Kari yourself? Well, sure. Um, so early on, you mentioned it seems a little trivial to come back and talk about some of this stuff, given what else you've talked about. Um, you mentioned that you've got 30 full-time staff, and how many part-time staff do you have? We have 30 full-time. We have about 15 part-time staff who come in and teach classes, lectures, specific areas of kind of expertise, and then we employ over the year, somewhere about 100 teens who staff some of the community organizing work, who staff the farmer's market and the environmental education center. And as those of us who work in low-income communities know, that, that's critical. I mean, some of those folks are contributing to basic supplies and needs in their family. So that's the total kind of support system. So then aside from the full-timers, um, do you require or ask for a three-year commitment from the others as well? No. The idea is that if, if you're a 15 year old boy in our program, you have adult elders in your life who are gonna be there for your time through graduating from high school. And if somebody else comes in who's teaching video technology on a part-time basis, comes in for one year and leaves, you still have your core full-time mentors. And so uh, there's a foundation called the Thrive Foundation for Children that's based um, out west. And they specifically only fund groups that do a full-time staff model of mentoring. Not that there's anything wrong with any other approaches or that they're not necessary. 
but our engagement is that you as a 15 year old would have people in your life who will be there until you graduate from the program. Others who augment it certainly can come and go and we would never make that expectation. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Hi Kari, I have a question. Um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the um, international studies program that you do with young people and how um, do you fund that? Which program? I, I, your word dropped out. The international studies program. Sure. So one of the kind of culminating programs is our international study program. Um, this is a program where young people spend six months researching the culture, politics, and history of a nation in the African continent, Latin America, or the Caribbean. Um, usually the rotating list of countries you go to due to the depths of our connections in these countries are Ghana, Brazil, Cuba and Haiti. Those are traditionally the places that we go. Um, and so you'll spend six months as a young person coming to understand that country here, going through lesson plans. And then you spend a month with us in country in a very intensive engagement where you're meeting with USAID and embassy officials, where you're meeting with other youth groups who visit on a regular basis, where you're obviously doing the cultural and historical sites. Each country has its own focus on in um, Ghana, we're focusing on Pan-Africanism, the transatlantic slave trade. In Brazil, we're focusing on arts organizing in the favelas. Uh, in Cuba, we're focusing obviously on political systems and the difference between communism, socialism, and capitalism. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of um, pre-work that's done. It's the ultimate carrot of the program. So you don't walk in and say, hey, I want to go to Ghana or Cuba with you this summer. We have adults who try to do that. It doesn't work. <laughs> you have to be in another program in our rites of passage, in our environmental program, in our community organizing program, and be doing well. And then you apply to the international study program. And we use it as the ultimate lesson teacher for our young people. So if the applications for that program are due on Friday, December 1st at 5 p.m. and you hand it in at 6, you cannot go. If you miss your interview, you are cut. If you start and are accepted and you start not doing the homework associated with the program, you are cut. So we may have 50 of our teams who are in another program apply to go to Brazil with us. And over the six months, 30 will get cut. They're not cut out of the organization. They're in another program. They're wonderfully supported. And over the summer, they'll get another program to be engaged in. But it teaches them about discipline. It teaches them about meeting deadlines, things they'll need for college. And it's also that this is a free program for them. So they have to kind of earn their keep with their involvement and with their dedication. In certain ways, it's the most difficult program we have to fundraise for. Mm -hmm. There is a bias out there that we accept that international study and travel is vitally important for middle class and wealthy kids, yeah. vitally important for kids in college, but somehow not for economically poor black and brown kids when we know it's a transformational experience. Right. On the other hand, there are particular funders and individuals who love the idea of sponsoring a young person to spend this program with us in Ghana or Brazil or Cuba or whatever. And so they can be very um, sustained funders. But usually we have to use general ops support because it's very hard to find foundations and certainly any government to underwrite it. And yet it is one of the programs that is absolutely transformational. Most of us probably on this, this uh, webinar have traveled at some point in our life. We know how educational and transformational it is. Imagine spending a month in the kind of countries I talked about. Not just a month, but we have a young woman who went through our program, spent a month with us in Brazil, fell in love with Brazil, then went to Wesleyan and did their international study program for six months in Brazil and yeah. called us irate or emailed us or Facebooked us irate once a week because she didn't have the access through Wesleyan that we had. She was kept on university. She was told never to lose, leave campus, how dangerous Brazil was. She as an, uh, a black woman wanted to find the black community and struggled to find that because of the difficulties of accessing the favelas in much part, many parts of Brazil. And so we have deep connections to other social justice institutions. We have deep connections to youth organizations. Mm -hmm. And our young people are then exposed in an entirely different way than you, know, you would go on your normal travel to one of these places. And so we see it as a critically important program because of the connection to rites of passage, number one. Number two, because it's the ultimate carrot that keeps so many young people engaged and wanting to attend. Um, and number three, because we live in a more and more interconnected global world. And so for a young person who's coming from the kind of communities we work in, to go off to college and to say they spent a month in Cuba, a month in Brazil, and a month in Ghana is absolutely transformational in terms of opportunities and access and seeing the diversity 
and in certain ways, the consistency of the world as well. Thank you, Kari. You're welcome. All right, we've had quite a few questions coming through the chat, so I'll just start bombing through these. Okay. Um, what kind of PD do you provide for your staff, and are these led by existing senior staff, or do you bring in folks from the outside? We do both. We, have, uh, uh, we just had our weekly staff meeting, which is 11 to 1 every Tuesday, which is a catch-up on generally what's going on in the organization, and then there's a PD session for the second hour, um, and those can be internally run, I'll just throw out some examples. Over the last six months, we had one about immigration reform. Uh, we had one about black feminism and womanist thought. Um, we had one about uh, gender and gender identity. These were done internally. We had one about the, uh, the president's executive orders um, and the power or lack thereof of those executive orders. Uh, we had one on understanding the presidency internally. Uh, next week, we have two formerly incarcerated women who are coming in about to talk about their organizing work around uh, criminal justice reform. Um, we had outside folks who came in about providing emergency housing to young people and how to access the very complicated emergency housing network here in the city. We had outside folks who came in on how we can better serve our lesbian, gay, trans, bi, um, and questioning young people. Um, we had outside legal counsel come in to talk about again, issues having to do with immigration. Those are 10 over the last six months. And so it's a mixture of internal and external. Some of it's issue related, um, if we have the expertise inside. Sometimes it's that we think an outside person would be better for the obvious reasons we all know on, on, on this uh, webinar in terms of facilitation and you know just having somebody a little more disconnected from the work. We also do PD placement. So if there's a great placement, we've had our staff go through ones at NYU and Fordham and Columbia at the Department of Youth and Community Development, at colleague organizations. And so our college guidance counselor, we have supported her to go through trainings at NYU, Wesleyan, and um, another community development organization here, Goddard Riverside in New York City. And so she's gone through trainings with those three programs. So some of it may be individual to the staff person in their area, some are collective, but we're really focused on it. We do a huge amount of, of it. Sometimes our staff may feel like we do too much of it, but we're really trying to develop everybody's skills and constantly return to the necessary issues. Very good, thank you so much. Yep. Um, do you provide specific leadership training for your young people or does that develop naturally through your programming? No, it's very specific leadership training. It's based on our curriculum. We publish five books of curricula, three collections of young people's writings, two curricula on how to teach what we teach. It's all focused on developing leaders, uh, kind of, the lowercase l leaders of living your life in a different way, trying to live in a more ethical way. All of our young people in a single gendered environment define what it means to be a man or a woman, a leader, a brother and a sister. Those are intrinsically intertwined with leadership. Um, and then there's the bigger l leadership. You know, are you getting involved in the social justice issue? Are you speaking out for undocumented young people? Are you speaking out about the protection of women's bodies? Um, you know, both we want to happen. The first part is mandatory, though. You have to go through the program and understand moral and ethical development and what it means to take a stand in this society. If you then decide that you want to, you know, um, you know, be a nurse practitioner and you don't want to be organized as a policy person, that's fine. We're completely proud of you. If you want to be a social justice worker, you want to be a school teacher, a firefighter, you know, any of that is fine but how are you gonna live your life? And then for some of our young people, they take that next step of being involved in movement building and social justice work. Um, but it's quite intentional. We are a leadership development organization. And so without question, that's front and center. Excellent, thank you so much, Kari. Um, the next <coughs> question that came in, um, I'm, I'm gonna read it the way it was written because I think um, it gives it context. So I'm a white middle income lady trying to create program for at risk youth of color in a community where there's quite a bit of unwritten social, racial and financial segregation. What are your thoughts on the best way to earn people's trust and really cross those social barriers? Again, I think this is critical work, you know, in this country. It historically has been. Just to, I'll answer the question from my perspective, but just to go back in time, you know, when we deal with some of the foundational issues of this country, the history of slavery in this country, you know, there were 13 generations born into slavery in this country. 
There were four generations born into segregation, American style apartheid. Uh, my father lived in segregation for 25 years. Uh, there have been two generations born legally free. So that's the reality of the history of black people in this country. Over those first 17 generations, um, there was a lot of ally work done, right? There were progressive white people who were involved in the abolitionist movement, clearly involved in the effort to end segregation in the civil rights movement. People of all ethnic backgrounds, Asian and Latino as well, but certainly a lot of progressive white folks. Um, I think that when you look at the history of the country and change, the kind of movements I've talked about and we talked about in the film, they've almost always been movements where there have been hands extended and people have worked together. Um, and so when I look at the challenges facing us now, I think it's absolutely essential that the same kind of outreach is done, that people of good faith come together across the bridges and divisions, <coughs> excuse me, across the bridges and divisions that certainly do exist. And I think the first most important thing is to recognize that they do exist that there is a lot of fear, that there is a lot of concern, there is a lot of discomfort across in those lines. And I think that most of the time people want to have that acknowledged, that we recognize the realities of the difficulty of building bridges, but that we are committed to moving across those. We don't act like they don't exist, we don't act like those bridges are not in place, but that we have to work collectively on these issues. And so I don't think we solve the issue of immigration and the conditions faced by undocumented young people unless documented people and citizens stand up, right? This cannot be the fight of the undocumented and the overwhelmingly Latino population. That is not right. Any more than we will ever continue to advance the fight against sexism and misogyny if, quote, it's seen as work by women. Men need to be involved. Male allies need to be involved. Not leading, but clearly participating and supporting. When we deal with the issue of race in this country, I know all too often what black people feel is that white folks will not recognize the history of racism and white supremacy in this country and the continued realities around it. How many good, well-intentioned people said the election of President Obama meant we were in a post-racial society. Major newspapers and magazines around the country trumpeted that idea, as opposed to the fact that two things can exist. An incredible advancement of the election of Barack Hussein Obama as President of the United States, a former civil rights leader, an organizer from Chicago, and at the same time, the prison industrial complex can continue to be as racist as it is. That we can continue to have New York City having the second most segregated schools in the country. That those two realities can exist. <coughs> and so I think to build bridges, we have to recognize the complexity of these issues um, and be front and center and honest in the language. And I think we do a disservice when we don't do that. So I think those are some of the kind of ideas that come to mind. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. Go ahead, James. Great. Thank you so much, Kari. Um, so we've got a few more for you. Uh, yeah. Is there a rubric that's shared across the organization <laughs> to evaluate youth and determine their eligibility for special opportunities similar to the international travel program? Or is each program evaluated individually? Any insight you can give us as to sort of how you're, you're evaluating student progress and student performance would be great. We're an evidence-based program. We're very committed to evaluation and have been for 20 years. Uh, the first thing we've decided is to put in place big tentpole outcomes that will determine success for us. We didn't want foundations to prescribe it. We didn't want government to prescribe it. We decided what those would be. And so again, I'll circle back to your question. Um, we are about breaking cycles of poverty in addition to helping young people to become social justice makers. The first statistic we look at is teenage pregnancy, direct correlation and connection to issues of poverty. Plenty of people have children as teenagers and go on to wonderful lives. But if we have a choice, we'd like young people to put off having children beyond their teenage years. The teenage pregnancy rate in Harlem is 17%. We're at less than 2%. The second statistic we look for is graduating from high school. New York City has a public school system of 1.2 million children. 70,000 graduate, I mean 70% graduate, excuse me, which results in 400 to 500,000 not graduate. Of that 70%, only roughly 30%, it fluctuates each year, are graduating college ready, able to go to a community college without remedial support. 
Now, while 70% graduate, that's an aggregate. Some communities have 99%. Our community has only 45%. So 45% of our community is graduating from high school. For our population, 90% is graduating. The third of four statistics is the 18 to 25 year old population. Right. In addition to them being an important age for social justice makers, we do a lot of organizing and activism with teens and folks go off to college and do campus organizing and then people become organizers later in their life. We need to really continue to create the channels for 18 to 25 year old youth organizers. And so for our 18 to 25 year old population, we either want them in college or working full time and engaged. In Harlem, 45% of 18 to 25 year olds are in college or working full time. We're at 95%. The fourth and final statistic is that after 22 years, nobody in our organization is incarcerated and less than 1% have a felony conviction in a community where one out of three men is under supervision of the prison system in one form or another. And so those are the major tent pole outcomes. To get there, we have 15 programmatic outcomes that are more about developing soft skills and agency, identity and who you are, moral and character development, that again, those of us in the field know. And what we keep saying to our staff every year, and I'm a broken record on this issue with our staff, is that don't focus on the four tentpole outcomes. Focus on these 15 really deliverable things that each year you're helping young people to achieve and aspire to. And if you do that every single year, we will then reach our tentpole outcomes. So that's the internal piece that we do. We're also engaged now in a deep dive to deepen our evaluation process around grades and academics and other outcomes in every program. And we're working with a group called the Arbor Brothers to further vet that after having worked with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and other consultants on earlier iterations of it. It sometimes is complicated for us because we work in so many different spaces. And so to evaluate our elementary age program, which serves eight to 12 year olds five days a week with a healthy meal, tutoring, and an enrichment activity is very, very different from evaluating if our international study program is working or our liberation program training community organizers is working. And so we have different evaluations that we're looking at for those populations, but everyone has to fit into what I started out saying. All of those programmatic evaluations, everyone has to hit, and those four tentpole outcomes, everybody has to hit. And our view is that it's kind of like parenting. If you are really supporting your children and unapologetically giving them love and support and believing in them, if you are there for them when they fall down and when they're successful, that's what we're asking our staff to do. And what we hope is that at the end of raising our children, quote unquote, they will be able to go into college or into the workforce as strong adults. But you can't point to one thing as a parent or you can't point to one thing in a private school. And so we don't point to one thing. We say it's the totality of our programs that achieve the evidence-based results that we seek. And so we're very focused on evidence, but we also push back with some of the folks around evidence in the foundation world who wanna dial it down to the one thing you do. We think that's utter nonsense. If people start talking about one thing to result in positive results for young people, I usually stop listening. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Um, we're coming to an end of our time together, but I have one more question for you, Kari. If you can get this in in our last five minutes, um, I'm hoping you can talk through your process of developing your theory of change. Also, how often does your organization come together to really evaluate and talk about that theory of change? So the organization constantly is looking at our theory of change from a leadership team perspective. We talk about it within the senior leadership group, for lack of a better phrase. And then twice a year, we revisit these documents with our full staff to make sure that we're on the right page. Um, there's been a lot of wordsmithing. So if remember, if you think of it like a pyramid, our theory of change is at the top. That has remained very, very consistent. Those 15 outcomes programmatically, the 10 curriculum focus issues, there's been a lot of wordsmithing around that. Uh, our analysis of gender and gender identity is very different today than it was 22 years ago. The front and center issue around immigration and undocumented young people is very different for us than it was 22 years ago. 22 years ago, the group we started with our Latino population was almost all Puerto Rican. Puerto Ricans are American citizens. They don't have the issue with deportation that undocumented folks or some recent immigrants have. So that issue has changed. So we've had to do a lot of analysis of how we're working through these issues and better serving young people. 
we've had to deepen our legal support over the years because of the need for our young people for more legal support. It's why I decided to go to law school and to become an attorney to be able to represent and support our young people and to bring in the civil rights law community to support our young people. So we've always evaluating our programs. The theory of change has remained much more consistent even though we revisit it each and every year. And we went through a very intensive process to reach it through a leadership, through other stakeholders, including the board and senior staff who previously were involved to make sure that on one level it was really clear, almost from a pedagogical approach that academics and organizers and activists would understand it, but also that our parents would understand it, I meaning the parents of our members that they would understand that we're providing support, guidance, love, and education to young people. We wouldn't get caught up in some of the nomenclature of our field that people are completely confused to what you're talking about. That we'd help their children learn to have discipline and form order in their life. That that's important to parents. That we provide opportunities and access. That it's, a, it's in a language that's accessible and hopefully clear to many people. And sometimes I think theories of change can get caught up in the, the pedagogical language of the time not clear to a lot of the stakeholders. We didn't want it to be that. There are some outside folks who said, well, that's not exactly a theory of change. You know, we're an organization that doesn't always do everything exactly as folks say we should do it. We have our own approach to doing things, um, much in the same way that our four themes have been the, the same since the beginning. Positivity, knowledge, community, and future. That also drives what we do. And those are intentionally broad and a little bit more nebulous because we want to be able to include a lot of things within those as kind of guiding tent poles. And so I think it's important every single year to return to whatever your guiding documents are. For us, our mission statement, our themes, theory of change, and our 10 curriculum focus issues, and to build them out. Um, and there are years where they'll remain consistent, there are years they'll change, um, but I think the constant reimagining of the work that we do is important because if the conditions change, at times our work must change, and yet the reverse of that is that this is a long fight we're engaged in, this issue of social justice and equity, and so there are also elements that we need to remain consistent, and we need to keep doing work in a consistent way because we're involved in a, in a long-term struggle. Excellent, thank you so much, Kari. Um, we have come to the end, um, unfortunately. I feel like we can sit and listen to you all day. Um, there are a few questions that came in, and Kari, if you don't mind, I'll follow up with you directly. Uh, more of them are sort of around resources and how do we get access to sort of to see how you do things on paper. Um, so I'll follow up with you directly, and I'll share those out with everyone who has registered and attended the webinar. Um, any final thoughts for us, Kari, as we, we go our separate ways today? Uh, just briefly, I'd say what, what I said in the beginning. Our, our work is more important now than ever our engagement around issues of social justice, creating tough art, as my cousin who's in the art world loves to say, art that questions, art that pushes. Um, to the person who asked the question about building bridges and connecting, I know it can be hard, it can be scary to try to cross lines. We still live in an unbelievably segregated society around issues of race and ethnicity um, and gender and gender identity. We have to push beyond that. Uh, you know, we live at a time where I think we have to have as big a tent as possible, and we kind of have to push beyond our personal um, fears to really engage. Um, and I think that we'll all be, you know, um, strengthened from it. And so I encourage everybody in the work. I think we all need encouragement each and every day. So I encourage you. I hope you all encourage me, and we all continue to kind of push towards, um, you know, the end result, which is a more just and equitable country. Amen to that. Thank you so much, Kari, for your time. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we will be in touch. Thank you again. Thank Have a good you. one.